there. So there's always language of we're on a journey, we're learning, but it was always, always, always met with the same tears, the same weight, the same, this is so hard for us. We're trying to understand, but they were trying to understand at 17, the same thing they were saying they were trying to understand when I was 32 and there was no change. And it took a long time to realize that people can use the language of I'm on a journey, I'm trying, I'm learning. You have to give me a chance to indefinitely postpone any real work. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. One of the things that I love most about this podcast is that in these times we find ourselves losing our attention span. (laughs) I mean, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but it's just unbelievable how much the internet has destroyed our brains and our phones have destroyed our brains. There's a discipline that happens with this show that I have to read books all the time for the show, and it forces me to read books, which are great. Books are great. And it's been a real delight to do that. And one of the things that I have enjoyed about it, and this particularly pertains to today's guest, is that like great writing has an ability to transport you and to make you experience things or feel like you can name or see an experience that you don't have in your normal subjective life. This is true of incredible fiction and also great nonfiction. It allows you to kind of transcend out past yourself in a way that like tweets don't and like all of the various kinds of flotsam and jetsam of internet content that crosses our eyes every day doesn't because there's a certain kind of like care and depth to great writing, to great prose, to great essays that allows you to see the world in a new way and particularly to see people's experiences in a new way. And that's true of the book today and the author today. The book that I just read in preparation for this conversation is called Something That May Shock and Discredit You by Dan. Daniel M. Lavery. And in the notes, the production notes from our our great editor, Brendan McDonald, to introduce this conversation, he says, you don't really ever say what the book is in the conversation. And that's because it's very hard to describe what the book is. I mean, I guess I would say it's a book of essays, a book of personal essays that revolve around two main themes. One is Daniel's transition to being a man. And the other is Daniel's upbringing and in a very religious household. That doesn't do enough credit to the sort of like quirky, beautiful, weird, sprawling nature of the essays that are collected here, some of which are just like almost kind of comedy bits, some of which are like imagined dialogue between like ancient like Knights of the Round Castle. (laughs) And this is true of all of Daniel's writing. It's brilliant writing. It's genre breaking writing. And it's very hard to describe unless you read it. You may have encountered Daniel's work at The Toast, uh, which he co-founded with Nicole Cliff, which is, again, a great website, quirky and strange and had like personal essays and had criticism and had humor, all in this sort of amazing Daniel sensibility. And he's now the Dear Prudence advice columnist at Slate. He also has another book called Texts from Jane air, which gives you a sense of kind of his sensibility. And this book, as you'll hear in the conversation, more than anything I've read, painted a picture to me of the inner life and subjective reality of transitioning better than anything I've encountered in writing or literature in a way that like really blew my mind and helped me as someone who's never had that experience understand it better. It's also, and as you'll see in this conversation, Daniel's extremely funny and extremely erudite and literate and makes a million different references to like the Western canon and to like biblical literature because he was raised in this very religious household. And more than anything, like Daniel is just like an extremely piercing and wise soul. And I think you will find this conversation soul filling. I want to say, Daniel, that this book is it's a strange book in the best possible way. And one of the things that I find incredible about the writing here is I feel like, you know, writing is at its best when it's communicating things that are hard to communicate and like ineffable. Mm -hmm. And to me, I just found the stuff about transition and the psychological experience of it opening a world to me that I just had no subjective access to, but was then being described in ways that were making things click in my head. Mm hmm. I mean, thank you, first of all. And I think that was part of what I was struggling with at the time, which was absence of any sort of like magical belief in the power of the chromosome. When anyone tries to describe to you their understanding of their gender and how they arrive at it, it all starts to feel a little, how do you anchor that? Or how do you understand your thoughts and feelings about that? So part of what I was trying to do during that time was put language to it in a way that made sense. Like, how do I understand this as something other than just like a shocking eruption 
And so I, th I think that's part of why it feels a little strange and disjointed because it felt like I was just trying to piece together something that had exploded and was trying to pinpoint the source of the explosion. Yeah, and the, and you talk about the point in the, your life that you're at. You say at one point that like you had sort of thought that the arc had finished. I mean, you're a young person. You're not like But like I old, knew but... I, could, I could look out and see like this is how my adulthood will go. But then something like a demon that comes in your room and whispers in your ear. I love this line. What if you were a dude, sort of? Yeah, and then no further questions. <laughs> and then escapes. And, and it felt, which feels like a very like Descartian thing to say. Like, what if a demon came into your room and whispered this to you? And I just imagine like all of his pupils being like, oh, let's write that down. Let's, that might happen. But yeah, it felt that immediate. It felt that instantaneous. It felt that same level of specific and vague. And it felt, at the time at least, sort of external to me because I was so used to having my relationship to my own desires. One of like, I just work here. You know, like boxes come in, I put them on the shelf. Um, so uh, uh, you mean and, and you said your own body. Yeah, I mean, your, yeah. your, your physical form in the world. Like, I'm just kind of here. Yeah. And, and, and mine I, in the store. I, I work here. I'm the guy from Clerks. Um, please don't ask me to make decisions above my pay grade. <laughs> the store works. It opens at the same time every day. You know, it's maybe not the place you would go for the like nice lunch, but it's fine. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, and then thinking, oh, I, I actually may have thoughts and opinions about this. And um, I might actually be able to make decisions on the basis of those thoughts and feelings um, in some ways felt thrilling and exciting and also just felt absolutely terrifying and just felt like I've just been given a promotion I did not ask for and do not want. And where is the manager? Yeah, that radicalness of the horizon opening up really, the way that you articulate the book really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Like putting yourself in the position of thinking about you think this is the boundary of the possible and then some insistent voice in your head just says, well, what if you just move past that boundary? Yeah. And what was that emotional, psychological experience like? I think primarily there was a real sense of, can I undo this? Um, huh. I, was, I was fine three weeks ago. I was fine six months ago. How do I go back to that? Um, how, I would like to unring this bell, please. You would like to unring the bell of the, of the, of the insistent question. voice, of yeah. the question yeah. of whether oh, I should do this. Absolutely. That was my primary goal at first was how do I get this to shut up? Things used to work around here. And then I think there was a real sense of, uh, you know, once that was uh, not a sustainable project, I think the question felt like, okay, this thought, this feeling has made me reconsider my relationship to past thoughts and feelings, which means I kind of can't trust my thoughts and feelings. So if I were to make any decisions based on my present thoughts and feelings, the one thing we've established is I can't trust them. Hmm. Um, so it felt like very tricky going in terms of all I know is that I can't be trusted and yet I am now considering making decisions that require a, a pretty high level of self-knowledge and, and, and trust of one's own mind. And, and so trying to sort through, is everything in my past discredited? Do I see myself in the past as a total dupe, as, as somebody who was doing their best? Were some of those things still sort of true and now they're just different? How do I make a decision now? And, and does it require my saying, before I had no idea, I knew nothing, now I know everything, and I'm certain, that didn't quite seem like the way through for me. Yeah, there's a, there's a consistent theme in the, in the essays in the book about trying to look back at childhood or, or past experiences and put them in their present context and kind of not wanting an oversimplification of it. You know, because I think there's some things like I in my life look back on at a certain period of time and be like, oh, I was out of my mind with anxiety. Like mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't know the thing. I couldn't name the thing. Like right. I had this stomach ache when I was a kid for like months and we like went to a bunch of doctors and they like took sonograms. I was like, well there's nothing physically wrong. I was like, well who knows? And yeah. now now I look back I'm like, oh I just had really bad anxiety. It was manifesting right. this way. It's right. like very clear to me. But throughout the book you're resisting this kind of binary switchover of what your childhood experience was. Yeah, and I think that was something that, that came to me mostly through talking to other trans people who were very gentle and patient with me as I went through a stage a lot of us go through, which is like panic and who's got the answer to this because it's not me. Like somebody else tell me whether or not I qualify and then I'll know what to do. Right, like there's some group that you have to get into and right. like show that you deserve to be in that group. And, and the thing that I was so grateful to all these trans people in my life for was this like, we have all tried this. No one will ever be able to tell you to your satisfaction if you are or you aren't. You can try to chase that dragon, but there will not be that moment. So you can 
investigate these questions further. You can consider the options that are available to you. You don't have to do anything. If not doing something becomes unbearable to you, you can try something. But it really is, you will have to be the person who makes that call. And, and I think that that patient redirection was really helpful to me, especially as I came to think of it as, Maybe I don't have to settle the question of what am I or what am I not today, but if I want to ask myself the question of do I want to consider starting hormonal transition or trying hormonal transition, what would that look like? That felt easier for me to break down. Um, and then I think there was less of that panic of like, I have to make this decision once and for all and permanently rather than you can take a little step and see how it goes. That landed so profoundly with me reading it because <laughs> I'm exactly the kind, same kind of person on just anything. I mean, obviously it's a bigger decision and, and sort of self-actualization wrestling you had to do than anything that I've personally faced. But that idea of like, do you press this irreversible button right. and forever change and everything's different? Or like, do you just start to sort of like see how it goes? Right. Right. And I think it was sort of like, I wanted it to be like astrology, where if I could just say, this is my birthday, someone could say, you're a Sagittarius. Right. Which is not to say that like, I know what that means, but just that there would be like, yes, that's a sign. We to looked that it up in the date. book. Yeah, we looked it up. It's a thing. If I could just say, I feel this, this and that, but not this, this or this. And somebody would say like, you're this. Go in peace. Here's your like workbook. Here's your toolkit. Here's your hat. And nobody was going to do that for me. And so how did you get to that point of the decision of like, well, let's 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 take a few steps down the road. There's always that sort of I think you can indefinitely let I dare not wait upon I dare. Um, and so I, I spun that out for a while, for about a year. Um, I found that uh, unsatisfying. A at a certain point, I, you know, I tried to keep a log of how I was feeling, partly because I knew if I don't, I will convince myself, I bet I just started thinking about this. You know, I bet this is super recent. And then I could actually look down and say, like, you've been writing down the same thing every day for eight months. Yeah. Um, you have not successfully banished this thought from your mind. So some of that was helpful just in terms of keeping a bit of a record of the direction and the intensity of my thoughts and my impulses. Some of it was being around other trans people and seeing the things that they had done and the things that they'd chosen to do and how that had gone for them and realizing like, oh, it is possible. People do it. It's not unheard of. You don't only have to figure it out when you are a child. And if you figure it out, you know, gasp in your 30s. You're just the oldest, oldest creature ever to drag itself across the face of the earth and you must just give up. And then I think also a sense of, I don't know that I have done maximum introspection but I've done enough. And the introspection seems to be providing me with diminishing returns. Hmm. And I would now like to add an action to that introspection. Um, and again, I had kind of created an arbitrary number of days to myself that I would try hormonal transition. And I just felt like maybe day one, I'll stop. And just reminding myself that I could do that was really helpful. It was like, it is not going to be an overnight gentleman switch where you're going to wake up and you're going to be, you know, 1997 era Brendan Fraser, which was the dream at the time. It's, I mean, obviously the dream. Always the dream. <laughs> that man was shocking uh, uh, to look at. Uh, well, truly, a truly handsome man and also like a really crazy Hollywood career that was explosively popular and then he started getting in the mummy movies mm -hmm. and then those kind of reached diminishing returns and then I read this crazy profile of him somewhat recently maybe in the last year or two yeah, about he's like, really been through it yeah like his body's all broken down like he was doing his own stunts and his body's broken down and like I just find that there's something so profound and, and cutting to me about the vagaries of fame and stardom mm -hmm. and people that are at a certain moment like incredibly incredibly like dominate the culture and then are not I really want good things for Brendan Fraser. I, I periodically think about, I think he has like a horse on his farm. I remember in that yes. profile, I was like, the horse brings me peace. And I was just like, Brendan Fraser, it's gonna be please okay. keep your horse, you and your okay. horse, like just look after yourself. Um, yeah, that's important to me. So, so you start to go down this road. Sure. And I found it really interesting. It's so fascinating to me because at some level when you like zoom out, right? for the culture mm -hmm. like the thing you're doing is in some political circles controversial it's mm -hmm. the subject of tremendous like state oppression and mm -hmm. bigotry but also in your head like you think there's like a model there's a little bit of like a student-ness to you mm -hmm. when doing it that I thought came through in a lot of what you write like there's like the perfect transitioning person yes and I'm falling short of that and I want to be that yes yes I am again like chasing after someone who was able to like be a woman perfectly so you could kind of have the like no one fired me I quit kind of vibe and I think some of that comes from a lot of the like dispiriting reactions that can come from the outside world which is like 
to disparage somebody's uh, ability to be a gender in a certain way. So I, it was sort of like, I wanted to be a woman so perfectly that when I transitioned, people would be like, wow, well, you must have really wanted to because you could have done both. And so like that you right, and yeah, me like and our... You weren't, you weren't kicked out and yeah. you weren't like failing at being a woman in yeah, some yeah. way. So Nobody like this... fired me. I quit. Right. <laughs> so, right. So like, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really intense thing to carry. And, and I think that that bit... Uh, that you're indirectly referencing, which is like you and me and our first six yeah, months on yeah, T and yeah. the idea of like, yep, just like flip from effortlessly like meeting, but also ignoring like women's beauty standards to meeting and ignoring men's beauty standards and any of the personality quirks that might have been read as charming in a woman and irritating in a man. You just threw them out the window and, you know, you're just uh, perfect and you're never problematic and your skin is so nice. Um <laughs> Yeah, off in the sense of, like, if I can be a trans person really, really well, I'm going to be loved, approved of. I'll somehow, by the virtue of my sheer lovableness and ability to meet everyone's expectations, be able to avoid transphobia. Which I'm, I'm very aware of, I think, in the work that that is a maladaptive coping strategy and a fantasy. Um, right, but also it's like completely relatable. I will be the best student. And like if I'm <laughs> right, going to be a exactly, trans person, yes. I will be a trans person so well. I will end transphobia. I will end everything. From now on, all straight men are going to be amazing at talking about their feelings. In the men's room, you'll walk in and everyone will be braiding each other's hair. And just like, oh, we're so glad you're here. Come in. Like, we have baklava. We all washed our hands. We love you. <laughs> Eye contact, cuddling, like just... <laughs> Which is also, I think, in addition to being a, a fantasy, it's also a little bit like monomaniacal. <laughs> like it's it's also a, a total fantasy of like control and power. In what way? In the sense of like I will change everything. Right. Like, like not just that you will change that you will go through transition, mm -hmm. but that like you will carry with you mm -hmm. some like better, more broad minded vision. Yes. Of maleness and i'll just be so then... damn lovable like in like an anne of green gables and i think there's a lot of interesting weird trans resonance in that story but like i don't know if you've read anne of green gables no. but it's very much like a plucky spirited orphan who wins over an entire island just by sheer winsomeness so that like by the end everyone's like that anne girl i don't know what we would have done without her even the crusty old neighbor rachel lynn who's like i don't know i don't know about her and by the end she's like you were right it's that fantasy. And yet, you know, like you, you write in the book and particularly about your family and others that, you know, the outside world is always there mm -hmm. through this process. Yeah. And you're in a dialogue with yourself and with different voices in the outside world finding this sense of loss or mourning or you talk a lot about grief, about mm -hmm. the idea of like a death that people are saying the experience about what you were undertaking. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I talk about that in a couple of places. I think especially the, the Tom Sawyer yeah. chapter. I think one of the reasons that I want to resist language that feels connected to death and funerals is I think there are better ways to talk about yep. loss. And I think that's the kind of way of talking about loss that's designed to shut something down without saying, like, you must not feel a certain way. When someone transitions, it is part of the work of life. It is creative. It is energetic. It it's is generative. animated. It's, it's generative, as you say. Um, and so to say someone has died yeah. when, in fact, that person is standing there and alive, I don't think that's the right language. I don't think that's accurate. And I think that that prioritizes somebody's vision of a past that you now know was, if nothing else, slightly compromised or you didn't quite have the full answer this, but when I say you, I'm, I'm talking about the, the cis person responding to right. somebody else's transition. And it attempts to leverage someone's past against them. And I think to say to someone, it feels like you're dead when they're there is... Um, yeah, insulting. It, it's cruel. It, it's cruel. And it's designed to talk them out of it, even if you wouldn't admit that that's what you want. Yes. Yeah. There's there's communications to you that are that. They're passive aggressive, yeah. essentially. It's just like very literally no one died. <laughs> like in the truest sense... There has been zero death here. I'm looking at my arms and so on. Uh, they're all there. Not even a little bit dead. Talk a little bit about the sort of what you do in that Tom Sawyer essay. I'll, I'll do a worse job explaining <laughs> it. Uh, yeah. So it's and again, I think there's a lot of stuff in this book because one of the ways that I think I, I kept myself safe in an environment where it would not have been safe to even allow myself to think about transition, by which I mean growing up very religious in the Midwest in the 90s, was to kind of Walter Mitty my own life, which is to say, like, just constantly daydream, constantly fantasize, constantly look for mental escapes, 
that meant I did not have to consider what I was trying to escape from. And one of the fantasies that I think I often found the most compelling was that scene in Tom Sawyer where Tom and Huck and the third kid, whose name I always forget, everyone in town thinks that they're dead. And they have one of those great funerals that I think almost all disgruntled teenagers imagine like they'd be so sad. The whole it's, town would get together. It's such a potent fantasy. It's, it is such a potent fantasy. Like Mark Twain knew what he was doing yes, in that Yes, he knew one. what he was doing. And it's, yeah, and it, it, it's still, it's, when reading your essay on it, it called it back to mind when I encountered it whenever I read it yeah, and years ago. It hits like a fever pitch of mourning and then the kids are like, fuck it, we gotta tell them. <laughs> and they burst out and everyone's like, oh my god, they're alive. We were so wrong. And then like the minister turns and he's like, sing everybody and everybody does. And it's just this like glorious moment of like a complete exertion of the will into making people love you and realize how wrong they always were about you. So kind of taking that apart and then using it to talk about what does it mean to want to say, good news, actually, you are so worried that I'm dead. I, I have great news for you. I'm not. My name just starts with a different letter now. Um, and, and how often that attempt to bring someone good news is not received as if you actually have good news. It's it's not actually about, let's talk about the poignancy, the hard parts, the good parts, and then move on together into the future. It's, I'm going to stay here and have a funeral without you forever. I want to get into your personal background and your family life. I'm going to do that right after this. You had a very religious upbringing, mm -hmm. uh, evangelical. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about that in your writing. Um, just talk a little bit about what your sort of life world was as a child in terms of the home you were in and, mm -hmm. the, and the religious experience you had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I grew up as part of an evangelical family in a mega church specifically, especially when we were in the Midwest, a church that was often mistaken for the local um, community college, just massive, massive complex. And most of my relatives work for or in churches in some capacity. My parents were, were ministers. So the degree to which um, that wasn't just something we did once a week. There was midweek church services on Wednesdays and Thursdays. There were youth group services uh, on Saturdays. There were weekly you know, youth group and Bible study meetings. There was after school Bible study. There was church summer camp. It was constant. And I loved to read. And I loved when my parents thought I was doing a good job. So I loved to read, you know, like, give me the Pilgrim's Progress for my 12th birthday and like, let me read more. And uh, I, I was very eager to receive praise. And, and one of the ways to do that was to read the Bible often, was to read other religious literature often. And, and, and that was such a, an easy way to get attention and approval and engagement. And um, there's a tremendous amount of erudition that comes through in the references in this book. I mean, it stuck with me. You're clearly a well-read individual. It, it worked. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there was also an underlying sense of every moment of your life is charged with spiritual potential, either hmm. uh, the potential to take you closer to God or further away from God, which is as exhausting as it sounds. Every moment, every action, everything you think or do or say is either slowly spiraling you closer to God or further away. So this constant taking the temperature of, well, what about that moment? What about that moment? What about that? What about that? That in some ways was kind of developed into like a, a compulsive set of ticks. And, and, and again, sometimes, you know, I can remember the book of Job very well, and that's really fun and, and interesting. And um, sometimes it's helpful for thinking through a situation carefully, and sometimes it feels like, Boy, I wish I didn't think about Corinthians so much, but like that's just how my brain works now. You talk about the rapture and your belief in that, and I've talked to other people who were raised in similar faith traditions, mm -hmm. and particularly in the rapture and like the way that just does a number on kids. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's been a consistent thing in various folks I've talked to in raised in evangelical households that like, you know, when you tell a seven year old the world might end tomorrow, mm -hmm. it sinks somewhere very deep in that. Yes, it does. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because I think we belonged to a slightly interesting tradition. Like, it wasn't quite as like full tilt conservative as many other yeah. similar evangelical organizations were. What that meant was less that there were fewer conservative beliefs and there was more a sense of slight embarrassment about certain beliefs. Hmm. So there was a sense of like, yeah, there's probably demons, but we don't feel comfortable making too many positive claims about what they're like. So we're going to mention it briefly and then just move on. So like, I remember like the, the left behind series were, were treated a little bit sniffingly, like uh. some of that's true, but like, it's embarrassing that he got too hung up on the details of it. So the message would often be like, we don't have an alternative to this that we're going to tell you about, but you shouldn't 
go all the way. So, so like it would be like, yes, there's the rapture, but like, don't get too hung up on that. That's a little embarrassing. We should just be focused on, you know, making our spirits more Christ-like. So that left me to absorb a lot of messages from uh, the church and the community at large without a lot of, here's what we do or don't think about that directly. So all of which was to say, the way that I kind of developed an idea of the rapture that I think really set the tone for a lot of this book was this idea of, I don't think I'm going to make the first cut. <laughs> like, that do- like I-, I already knew on some level, like, some stuff's coming down the pike. And I don't know exactly what it is, but like whenever someone says something's gay, I get like a freaked out feeling of like, I don't know why, but that's going to be me. And I, we can't think about that. I'm eight. It's too. Don't worry about that. But like, you're not going to make the first cut. And you can't really ask anyone about that because, again, there's that slight embarrassment of like, we don't need to talk about the rapture. It's real, but don't worry. Um, so it's like you won't make the first cut. But what could happen is, you know, you go home one day. Everyone's gone on the street. The rapture happened. You missed it. Now's your time to shine <laughs> because there's the second string. I don't know how you familiar you are with, with the book of Revelation, but there's the second string of people who do a really good job being chastened by not having made right. it in the rapture. So God will now, like the camera from the office, be watching you because there's so fewer people to watch. And you will be able to be sufficiently well-behaved, ashamed of yourself, and good at being alone that God's going to take pity on you and bring you up into heaven. Again, not because you like worked it out well with him the first time, but because you're going to be alone well enough, you're going to be repentant well enough, and you're going to suffer nobly. And that's what's going to get you up with the second the sec- strength. Second round draft pick. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so that was something that I think really informed a lot of the ways that I approached the idea of community, the idea of family, the idea of suffering and what it could do for me, the idea of what I thought God wanted from me, and how I could uh, make up for what I understood to be an inherent uh, factory error with the project of me. And you felt that early. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Did you have a moment in your faith life where you stopped believing? Oh, gosh. There are so many different little moments, a lot of stops and starts. Uh, there's so many different moments that I could point to. Not all of them stuck. I can tell you, I remember when I was eight, that's when I got saved. I remember like, you know, at that point in youth group, it had been like explained to us enough times what it meant to get saved and why you needed to and how great it was. Um, and, and just explain for folks that don't know the tradition sure. what, what getting saved yeah, means. Yeah, getting saved means in, in, in the like white evangelical tradition I was raised in was basically um, and, and kind of informed like trickle down Billy Graham, yep. um, who we didn't get directly, but we got a lot of trickle down uh, Graham um, was you ask Jesus to come live in your heart. Um, and that means that you're saved. That means you'll go to heaven. That's permanent. That will last forever. Nothing you can do can undo it except kind of, but don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, that's basically the idea. You are inherently separated from God by, by virtue of just being born and being alive. You're inherently sinful. But when you ask Jesus in your heart, no matter what you've done, you're saved. And in that tradition, it's done publicly and proclaimed. Mm-hmm. And unlike, you know, the Roman Catholic tradition I grew up in, where it happens when you're precognizant, right? You get baptized at, you know, two months or whatever. There's some agency or some choice that you're making that you're proclaiming in front of everyone right. that this is the case. Right. And of course, the thing that's kind of a little jarring about that is like our church had a minimum age for baptism. So there was this sort of idea huh. of you have to be close to an adult. You have to have the ability to make decisions for yourself. But the minimum age was 12 and so it, it was a little like no other decisions about your life or yourself or your autonomy were tagged to that age in our community. So it was a little bit like, now you're ready. Now you know yourself, you 12-year-old. Get in that lake. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was around eight years old and I remember- I mean, we should say that is, that's the bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah age. So right. there's, and there's a lot of traditions, there are a lot of religious traditions and and cultural traditions that center on that age. Oh, in absolutely. Tons yeah. Of places. To be clear, I don't have a, an objection to like right. certain religious rituals yeah, yeah. Uh, taking place around the age of puberty. Right. But the idea that this inviting Jesus into your heart idea that can happen publicly at 12 is, is it's interesting. It's interesting. So, but, but this was before I wasn't allowed to get baptized till a few years after, but when I was eight, I was like in my room reading my Bible and I was struck by, you know, I, I need to do it. It's time. And almost my first thought was, my parents are going to be so happy. And they were. And, you know, I, I like knocked on their door. I went into the room like, great news, kids. Like, great news, mom and dad. 
it's it's time. And they were thrilled. They were over the moon that this eight year old had decided to become permanently saved. And I'm finding this so affecting, actually. You know, uh, just like just I, I just see it in my own kids. Like the desire to please your parents when you're that age is huge. it's so profound. It's huge. So You'll overwhelming. do anything. And yeah, you see it in their eyes. I mean, even with my my middle child who's five, my my son, the desire to get affection from his older sister yeah. like and and they just at that age you just want to please your parents so yeah. desperately and they you know they wrote it down in, in my bible and they wrote a, the phrase a new hope for a lost sheep and i told my mom it feels like i'm under a tap of warm bath water and it was just like yeah that's what it felt like when my parents were really proud of me and yes. approved of me like that's so so when you the say tingling of parental affection and love so on some level i i knew in that moment at eight well, we all know what this is, which is I, I wanted to make you happy, and I did, and that's great. And it wasn't like I was like uh, like smoking a cigarette or like, there is no God. <laughs> you are all fooling yourselves. But like I, I had a sense in that moment of like there's no other option here. I know what you want, and you're going to get it. And it's sort of weird that we have to all pretend that this is voluntary, but I'll give it like, you know, I'll be a star. Like, frankly, I think my like – this just feels weird to say my conversion at the age of eight, before which I was, you know, a, a seeker on the long and lonely road. Uh, yeah, my conversion at the age of eight to evangelical Christianity was certainly a moment where I was aware on some level of this is not what it's supposed to be. This is not real. As you get older and you sort of are dealing with your sexual identity mm -hmm. and recognizing there's something that, in your words, like a manufacturing issue something's coming down the pike yeah, yeah sorry to be clear I, I i use that language as shorthand of like how i realized that was something that was not going to go over well right i'm not trying to claim that like i'm broken no no of yeah, course yeah. not no i mean just right but it's sort of i think captures something profound about mm -hmm. the way that children deal with a feeling in themselves that there's something in them that maybe will not meet from approval with approval from their parents and other folks mm -hmm. like in your adult life what were those conversations with your family like Unbelievably painful. I think one of the things that was most challenging for me was it, it would have been easier to recognize as like, I need to draw a boundary here or it's okay for us to take a break from this or it's okay for me to say like, you don't like it, I do, that's fine. If there had been yelling or obviously cruel and hostile words, right. but it was just constant devastation, Oof. grief. Where did we go wrong? Why don't you want to tell us these things? And this is you telling them... Uh that you're gay, basically. You know, first first it was that I liked girls. Then it was that I, you know, didn't dress up in skirts anymore in college. Then it was that I was okay with the idea of premarital sex. Um, then it was, you know, that I had friends who weren't Christians and I didn't see it as my responsibility to save them. Then it was that I was transitioning, you know, take your pick. <laughs> um, a lot of those. And, and the weight of feeling like every time we, and I would always want to not talk to them about it Ugh. because I was always hoping that we would never have to. And of course they would eventually drag it out of me. And then, so then the first objection would be, why didn't you tell us? Like, why are you so deceitful? Why do you hide? Why are you evasive? Why won't you look me in the eye? And then how did this happen? How did we miss this? This is dev like as if I had blighted their crops and they just wanted to know why. And it wasn't even quite the like, we're not angry, we're disappointed. It was like, we're suffering and we want to try to understand. Trying to understand hurts us more than anything could. Um, but please, let's keep but, talking. Yeah, yeah. And it, it just never got better. So there's always language of we're on a journey, we're learning. But it was always, always, always met with the same tears, the same weight, the same, this is so hard for us. We're trying to understand, but they were trying to understand at 17, the same thing they were saying they were trying to understand when I was 32. And there was no change. And it took a long time to realize that people can use the language of, I'm on a journey, I'm trying, I'm learning, you have to give me a chance to indefinitely postpone any real work. Um, and that's I still, an intense thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not to say like I don't I don't at all mean to say that it is suspicious when somebody says I'm trying. Yeah. But it is hard because you, you kind of don't know until it's like, oh, God, it's been five years and you actually there's no fruits of your labor. Maybe you've been trying, but if you've been trying, you're not trying in the right way. And so it can often take a very, very long time to realize, I think you are misusing the word journey and you need to stop using the word journey. 
And it would have been easier, what you're saying in some ways, if the language had been more definitive. Oh, God, it would have been so helpful. Like, we reject this. This yeah. is wrong and we reject this. Yeah, I, you know, either either then we could have parted ways sooner or I could have just said, like, you know, OK, see you at Christmas. We're going to have a slight. But it was, again, that every moment in your life is charged and takes you further away from the family or closer to the family. And there was always that, please come back, please come back, please come back. And I wanted to. Of course. I wanted to very badly. And I tried to cut off the various parts of me that I felt like were preventing that total ability to be held within the fold. That didn't work. But yeah, yeah, that can be very painful. I feel um, that we should talk a little bit about something that's in the news right now Mm -hmm. regarding your family, just because I think if people, uh, you have a large following and people follow you and know this is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, Your father's a pastor in Menlo Park in the San Francisco Bay Area Mm -hmm. who recently stepped down from that position. He's on um, leave and Uh he's on a reinstatement plan. Okay. Um, So he has not preached since November, but he has retained his position. And maybe you can describe the events that led to that. Yeah, um, I I released a public statement this Sunday, um, so I I don't have a lot to add to it. But yes, um, a a person who volunteers in the church came to John several years ago. Um, This person volunteered with children um, and, and confessed that they were sexually obsessed with children and that they considered the work they did with children to help treat their urges. Um... At, at which point my father encouraged that person to continue working with children, not to seek counseling and not to tell anyone else. Uh, and that was their plan. Uh, in November, I learned about this plan. Um, I asked my father questions about how he was going to handle it or why he had been not handling it, why they had entered into a secret pact. Mm-hmm. Um, and he got very angry. Um, and he told me I didn't have the grounds to give advice. Um, and at that point, um, my, my wife, Grace, and I decided um, that the only safe and sustainable thing to do was to inform the church, ask the person in question to stop working with children and to seek counseling immediately and to end that conversation. And so that's what happened. I'm no longer in contact with uh, anyone in my family of origin. Um, and since my marriage, I've taken my wife's last name, which is lovely. It's lavery. It sounds so nice. Um I, you, I don't want you to talk about this more than you want to, but mm-hmm. just in terms of the emotional toll of that, I, I just can't even begin to imagine, even given the preamble that we've just been discussing yeah. <laughs> and the years of this, yeah. how difficult that must have been to both have that conversation with your father and then to take the, the actions that you did. Inhumanly. It was, I mean, it was both incredibly easy it was not a difficult choice, but it was very hard. Sorry, I know I just said it wasn't easy and it was easy, but I, I suppose what I mean was it was a difficult thing to do, but it wasn't hard. It was so clear to me where the failures of uh, leadership and accountability were. It was so clear to me what the right thing to do was. Um, and so there was just no question. But I, I had to go against everyone in my family, and that was very painful. Um, one of the things that I did change in the writing of this book was I talked a little bit about a couple of years ago, my parents' church left the Presbyterian denomination right after the Presbyterian denomination moved to allow for the possibility of gay marriage and gay ordination. It's a matter of public record how much the church paid to leave the denomination. It was a little less than $9 million. My parents sold their house in order to raise, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of like one and one and a half million of those dollars. And it was to join a denomination that had a much more conservative take on that. And they always said, it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. That's just really bad timing. And I just didn't want to think about that. And so I said, wow, that sounds like really bad timing. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I think one of the things that was painful was to go back and look at other moments in my life where I could see the ways in which I had allowed wishful thinking to make what was obviously true appear complicated, um, if that makes sense, rather than pretty straightforward. Obviously true meaning what? Obviously true, like they left the denomination because of gay people. You know, they wanted to say the quiet part quiet and the loud part loud. Right. And so it was just like total coincidence. We've actually never even heard of gay, what, gay marriage. What's that? No, <laughs> nothing to do with it. Totally unrelated. Uh, we, we did have to dig up nine million bucks, but like that was just because we were feeling ready for a fundraiser. 
and now it's great. Um, and it's just like, of course it was about gay people. Of course it was. Right. But because they were, you know, friendly-ish. And on their journey. On the journey. You could be on a journey for so damn long. You just mentioned your wife. How I, I wonder how, um, what marriage has done, provided you, been part of in this? I mean, the sort of subject of the book in many ways is the profound dislocation and searching that, mm-hmm. that has been characterize a lot of your life Mm -hmm. particularly recently yeah and i know from my own subjective experience that my the 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 most stabilizing grounding thing that exists in my life is my relationship to kate my wife like Mm -hmm. there's nothing remotely like it Mm -hmm. that like holds me in place in the best way which is like the place of the person that i want to be the most yeah and i would imagine that that takes on even more force in the context that you have entered into it. Very much so. I mean, I don't know how I would have got through the last two months without Grace's clarity, courage, commitment, energy. There were often times when I just felt like, you know, just the world had come undone and all I wanted to do was stay in bed. And it also felt like this is the kind of person I want to build a life with. These are the kind of values I want to espouse with her. It's not based on categorizing people as good or bad, and then the good people always do good things, so we have to protect them when it looks like they do bad things because they're the good people. And it has much more to do with how do we as a community hold one another to account all the time so that everyone abides by the same rules in public and in private. And and I think that's something that I admire. You know, my marriage, my relationship with my my wife is unbelievable it's wonderful it's expansive it looks nothing like any of the marriages i ever grew up seeing it's not one that's bound up in monogamy or reproduction or children or protecting secrets and it's fucking fantastic (laughs) and it was not something that like you know if i went back in time to that little eight-year-old like daydreaming about impressing god with sufficient like self-loathing until god like airlifted me up into heaven i would have just been like what (laughs) You can, you can do all that stuff. And I'll be like, yeah, it's pretty great. Well, that is, I mean, you know, we've gone through many different emotional modalities here, but mm-hmm. the, the, there's a lot of joy in this book about where you are now, I right? Think so. I mean, for all of the self questioning and the difficulty mm-hmm. and the movement, like you have a few phrases where you describe the sensation, the sort of. Sp- for lack of a better word, spiritual sensation yeah. of where you are now. Absolutely. A- absolutely. I think, you know, prior to transition, I often thought the best case scenario for me is where I found out about transition mysteriously a week too late, just a little too old, like Molly grew in The Last Unicorn. And now all I can do is kind of wistfully think about what might have been. And then the difference between that and actually taking those steps and pursuing transition and realizing like, oh, holy shit, you can just do stuff even if you wish you had done it before. And it and it you're allowed to and it works and you can be with other people who do it and you no longer have to Walter Mitty like which is not to say I can't still take refuge in maladaptive fantasies. I I do, but that happens so much less often now. Um and that what had bound me up so much, I think, prior to transition was the idea that the best thing I could do was live um in order to avoid the possibility of future regret which is to say make as few decisions as possible or in this area because what if you did it and you regretted it that would be the worst thing that could happen so the best thing is just sit in a room eating crackers not washing your dishes imagining that you look like a cartoon pilot that is in fact not the best possible no. vision of it's, my life in some ways it's like sort of a perverse pascal's wager right that like the downside like you know pascal sitting there whether you should believe in god or not and like mm-hmm. basically says like well if you if you don't and there's a hell that's the worst situation and but if you do and he doesn't exist and it like yeah what's the worst that happened then you just die you wasted your life in a room of crackers right so like you exactly you might as well just like live to avoid regret essentially Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and i think that's often bound up with transphobia is like the worst thing that could happen is that a cis person could mess up and then not be perfectly cis anymore Um, and that's something that caused me personally a lot of damage and i think other trans people have suffered a lot as a result of that line of thinking and then also just continuing to Um, talk to other people, admit that I was thinking about transitioning, leaning on other trans people for support, asking for their perspectives, their experiences, their advice, talking to my therapist, talking to my doctor, making decisions, testing them out, seeing how I felt, continuing with them. Then it was just like, oh, this is so much better than the like year I spent trapped in my house crying about how I couldn't transition. And, you know, whatever that year was, what it was, I needed to go through it. But it was just such a sense of like, Jesus, God, even if I ended up like 
changing like even if I ended up hating all this in five years I would have such a great set of tools for dealing with yeah. having a complicated relationship with my body I would be it would be better it would genuinely be, be better and also it's just you know it's, it's an amazing thing about how the thing that you are ashamed of or that you hold as a deep secret like when you talk to other people about it loses its power yeah. I mean that and that's just like a very cliche insight but mm -hmm. it is I mean for someone with a Roman Catholic upbringing an Irish Catholic upbringing in part where like just push it down keep it to yourself yes. is like a very big um a, a very big adaptive tool that you're taught like it is true that when you bring those things out and you enter them into social communion with other people, they get less terrifying, weighty. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's a line in there from a friend, Julian, who often also uses religious language that I love, not necessarily in a like straightforwardly Christianist fashion, but in a way that uses the language of like creation and, and change and, and vocation and, and godliness that I like quite a lot. And it's something like um, the reason that God made me transsexual is the same reason that God made wheat and grapes, but not bread and wine, which is so I could participate in the mm. act of creation. And I think about that often as a sort of like restorative way of reading transness into the idea of vocation from God or the act of being a human being where the work is to name things, to identify things, to grow things. The, the good version of holding dominion over the earth, which is to do good work within it, um, not to dominate it. And then I think of like, you know, the really sweet, cute youth pastor in seventh grade who did the one talk on gay things the church ever did, which because again, they were like, we don't want to be the scary homophobes, but we got to say one thing. And he was so cute and I had such a crush on him and he was so sweet and he was so sad when he was like, you know, obviously you got to love everyone, but being gay is like, and you know, he had this big mirror that was like cracked and had a veil over it. That was, all, and so it was just like this fucked up looking mirror. It's like, that's what it is. That's what you're doing to the, you know, the, the glorious body that God gave you. Oh, isn't that too bad? But let's be super nice to gay people. You guys don't say the F word. And like, that was it. And, and I compare that to the statement about, you know, bread and wine and transsexuality. And I just think like, that was the message was just like, God gave you something good. All you can do is fuck it up. Don't do anything with it. Leave it alone. And that's such a pernicious lie, which is to say to people, growth and change are dangerous. They'll take you away from God. If you want to do anything with your body that didn't automatically happen to you at birth or puberty, you're ruining something. Don't be creative. Don't have ideas. You just work here. You know, God made this. You just work here. You just man the desk. Do that until you die. And so I think that's part of why the joy was important for me in the book, because I truly have seen and experienced the way that generative work, work that involves naming things, putting new names to things, changing things, transforming and creating things. That's godly. That's lovely. That's life giving. And it brings joy to people. And it's I mean, that's good. what Adam and Eve do. It, it, <laughs> that's right there in the book. I know, I yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Yes. As you know, like yeah. that's the first thing they do. Right. The first thing that one of the first things that God has them do, they 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 name things. Yeah. They they make do with what they can in the world that they have. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of nice ways to look at Adam and Eve that aren't simply about like, well, they have two different names. <laughs> so that's all we should know about gender. <laughs> this book is such an interesting project because it's like, it's sort of discursive. It's kind of, it's really beautifully, beautifully written. I can't stress enough what Thank a you. remarkable writer you are. You're really um, an excellent, excellent, excellent stylist and i wonder like what you what your literary ambitions are oh my gosh uh ideally the transsexual barbara pym <laughs> wait who's barbara pym well know. i'm very excited for you because this means i'm going to start spamming you with information about barbara pym um but she was i was tempted to be like oh yeah just nod like i knew but no, i'm just no, no, gonna no. i'm just gonna like confess to my ignorance here she was a um British writer in the mid 20th century who wrote slightly unfashionable novels about the inner lives of um, extra women who mm. kind of like lived on the uh, fringes of the church's social life. Um, and, and then her books fell even more out of fashion until Philip, um, I, I might mess this up. I think Philip Larkin, he was like a huge fan of hers. And he was like, everyone needs to read Barbara Pym. And then she was like, oh, that's nice. And then she died. But she wrote these like quiet, detailed but often quite intense inner lives of like the kind of person who like offers to do the dishes at a party someone else throws and immediately starts washing them. And is like, God, why did I do that? I don't want to be standing here washing the dishes. I want to be attractive and interesting and talking in front of a fire, but I'm not. I'm doing the fucking dishes again. Um, so that's, that's the next move. That's the next move. Or like uh, transsexual Marion McCarthy. 
write a new version of the group where everyone's like, yeah, we all went to Vassar, but now we had top surgery and we're fighting. <laughs> that would, I, there, there'd be a market for that. That book sold very well, yeah. I, I should think. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, but yes, I would love to write a novel next. That's the one kind of book I haven't written. I've done jokes. I've done short stories. I've done essays. I need to, I need to write a, a big a big project. I hope you do write a novel. Well, I have an ADH screening next week, so hopefully that will help. Daniel M. Lavery is the author of Something That May Shock and Discredit You, which is out now. I really, really, really recommend it highly. Um, He writes for Slate's Dear Prudence. He's written Dex from Jane Eyre, The Merry Spinster, and hopefully some kind of novel in the future. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Once again, my great thanks to Daniel Lavery for that fantastic conversation. The book is called Something That May Shock and Discredit You. As you can tell, I highly recommend it. You can also read Daniel's work at Dear Prudence and in previous books, text from Jane Eyre and The Merry Spinster. Also, we've gotten a lot of feedback from you guys that you would like us to sort of put together a comprehensive with pod book list because we do so much reading and it's fun to do the reading together. And so we're working on that. We're going to post a with a comprehensive with pod book list that we will keep updating. We'd love to hear feedback from you. Tweet us the hashtag with pod, email with pod at gmail. Com. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In team, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to NBCNews.com slash why is this happening.